the EU has confirmed it will label goods from illegal Israeli settlements as such. And as is common, the usual accusations of anti-Semitism have risen like a chorus from Israeli officials. This is while Israeli atrocities continue with its attacks on hospitals increasing as seen in its latest fatal raid on a West Bank hospital as well as its policy of home demolitions. As Western officials such as the London Mayor Boris Johnson have called the BDS movement completely crazy and the UK blocks a delegation of Gaza medical experts from entering the country for a conference on war zone trauma, one wonders if the West is on the wrong side of history. That and more in this edition of the debate. Let me now introduce our guests for this edition of the debate. We're joined by Middle East expert and journalist Ms. Hafsa Kara Mustafa, who is joining us live from London. And we're also joined by journalist and political commentator Mr. Philippe Asuline, who is joining us live from Los Angeles. Thank you both for joining us for this edition of the debate. Ms. Kara Mustafa, I'll start with you. Uh, the EU's move to label these Israeli settlement goods has garnered accusations from among Israeli politicians of anti-Semitism and even comparisons to Nazis. Though Zippy Livni has called for a policy change while rejecting rejecting charges of anti-Semitism. How do you feel about this? Well, I think the word anti-Semitism is a, a word that has been used and abused so many times it has lost absolutely all meaning. It's a word that constantly is regurgitated by Israel and by uh, Zionist apologists to actually justify every single atrocity they commit against the people of Palestine. And of course this is a rather perverse technique because of course they are portraying the, uh, the atrocities committed in Europe by Europeans against European Jewry and somehow transferring it, A, to the Palestinians and also associating it to the Palestinian cause. Of course, this is absolutely preposterous and ridiculous. And just today, uh, a poll conducted uh, in the UK has revealed that almost 41% of British Jews feel uncomfortable with the policies of Israel and are actually in support of a boycott campaign. So it really suggests that if even Jews are in favour of this, I think the idea of labelling this campaign anti-Semitic is pretty much ridiculous. Mr. Asulan, how do you feel about that? Um, the effect of labeling goods that were uh, produced in Judea and Samaria, or the West Bank, is perhaps partially triggered by anti-Semitism, but I think anti-Semitism is the effect, like this labeling, not the cause. Uh, and it's the effect of a decades and decades long campaign of emotional manipulation, perfectly exemplified by your introduction, by the way, which sounded more like a sermon. Uh, it's like you're afraid of letting people make their own decisions. So this emotional manipulation, probably like the images you're showing right now while I'm speaking, of using the suffering of children, of using the analogies to all kinds of victims throughout history to slowly turn everybody against Israel, makes it very convenient now for the EU to do this, to get the votes or whatever support it needs. Meanwhile, there's actually much less questionable and much more brutal occupations going on at Europe's doorstep within Europe, and nobody's making a fuss about it because they're not accompanied by a campaign of propaganda and the use of trigger words like Ms. Mustafa has been using and like your introduction used. Ms. Kar, Mustafa, go ahead. I saw you smiling. Well, I, I have to say, I do admire my co-panelist Hutzpah because actually accusing the Palestinian side of em using emotion when for the past 70 years, Palestinians have actually been, had to endure uh, lessons about the Holocaust, a Holocaust in which no Arab or African nation has played a part is absolutely, I mean, it's, it's, it's astonishing to be honest and hats off for Mr. Asselin to come up with this argument. Uh, but the point about the, uh, the, pr the, the issue happening again near European doorsteps is another distraction. Uh, the bottom line is no other country uh, actually has lobby groups such as Conservative Friends of Israel, Labour Friends of Israel in the UK government for instance, or co uh, organisations such as APAC in the US which yield enormous power against uh, within the governments of these countries and therefore ensure that Israel has a very very particular status. So the argument we often hear is that of course there are other atrocities committed say perhaps in Sudan or Saudi Arabia but the fact of the matter is that there isn't a Labour Friends of Sudan governing uh, the British government or sorry or the Conservative Friends of Sudan actually consisting 
consisting of the entire cabinet of the uh, government of this country. There isn't a lobby group within the US that actually consistently supports Sudan. So again, these manipulative co comparisons are very much part of the Zionist ideology. But frankly, unfortunately, the uh, public opinion of various countries, of course, always across the Middle East, but even today in the West, is actually waking up to this manipulative technique and is voting with its feet by actually rejecting Israeli product and condemning every single Israeli atrocity. Mr. Solana, of course, I'd like to get your reaction to what Ms. Carr and Mustafa there said, but I also wanted to add this on and get your opinion on um, this, uh, this raid of Israeli undercover forces on this hospital in the West Bank, which, which resulted in the death of a Palestinian. Um, the Palestinian health minister said uh, that the execution of the Palestinian inside the hospital proved that Israel does not respect international conventions and international humanitarian treaties. How do you feel about that? Well, first of all, I want to respond to what was said uh, and basically throwing my argument back at me uh, when everybody knows that the Palestinians have been comparing themselves to apartheid victims, to victims of genocide, to Mexicans crossing the border into the U.S., to Rosa Parks, to civil rights and recently to Jesus. They're exploiting everybody's vulnerability. Actually, the anti-Israel groups, a lot of them are not even Palestinian. They're exploiting everybody's vulnerability, just like she does, by referring to Jewish conspiracies as if there's not a super rich Gulf Arab oil lobby in every country. And again, the purpose is to emotionally turn What's people the against Israel. Equivalent? This case about the hospital is the same story. I'm not done. I'm not done. This case about the hospital is the same story. Okay? Now, it's framed as such to make people believe or feel on a deep emotional level that Israel is going to come attack them in a hospital, when in fact the Palestinian Authority itself should have arrested this young man who decided to stab a middle-aged Israeli for no reason in the neck with a hunting knife because he was taught some takfiri, ISIS-like nonsense on the internet. Now, Israel chose to send 20 soldiers there to arrest him and risk their lives instead of using a drone or an airplane strike the way Russia and Iran and the US and Europe are doing in Syria with takfiris there who don't even threaten them. Hamas, by the way, has been using hospitals for at least 15 years to place its terrorism command centers, including in Gaza Chief Hospital, and it's been using ambulances to transport bombs. But you don't feel it adequate to report that. Ms. Mustafa doesn't feel it adequate to pay attention to that. She's just going to come back with more words, atrocities, and other triggers like that that don't apply, making declarations about international law that she does not understand, just to make people feel like Israel's threatening them, when in fact Israel is here pr uh, protecting innocent people. And sometimes that means you have to go arrest a terrorist in a hospital who should have been arrested by the Palestinian Authority. Ms. Kar Mustafa, um, you know, the uh, Palestinian health minister, again, I'm going back to him, said that the storming of hospitals all the time is something like a habit. Um, and since the beginning of October, we've seen hospitals in Nablus, Jerusalem al-Quds, Hebron al-Khalil being raided by Israeli forces. Um, how do you feel about that? Well, for one thing, I'd, I'd be curious to find out what is the Gulf equivalent of APAC in the U.S., other than the Gulf countries actually buying billions and billions of dollars worth of arms and unfortunately using it against countries such as Yemen. I don't see the that. equivalent, in fact. Um, but, of course, I also see... I'm not done either. Thank you very much. But, of course, uh, the idea of a police force or an army actually entering, dressed up in one case as a pregnant woman at 3 o'clock in the morning and gunning down the person actually sitting by the bed of a person who we don't know whether he's guilty or not because of course there wasn't a trial to actually determine his guilt uh, I think that is the actions of a mafia that is how mafias operate that is not how supposedly democratic states operate it's as simple as that I don't see any other country actually going in and sending a commando inside a hospital with some of its men dressed as pregnant women and gunning down people in hospital rooms now just because the US which is obviously the uh, the patron of Israel commits atrocities with drones and we know that for a fact obviously that's why it delivers three billion dollars in aid to the US doesn't make it any more acceptable uh, but just another point bringing constantly Iran into this I don't remember Iran droning anybody in such a way so I don't really see why bringing Iran into this equation but just to remind uh, viewers I think Israel has committed consistent acts of violations of international human law and in fact the proof is in the pudding where 67 UN resolutions have been violated by Israel to this day. 
Mr. Asselin, of course, I want to get your reaction to that. And I wanted to add on, uh, if you allow me again, um, yes. a national board member of Jewish Voice for Peace has recently said, and I'm quoting him now, we believe that when Palestinians can freely elect their own government and negotiate on an equal basis with Israel, they will determine the best solution. BDS is a tactic to force Israel to the negotiating table, and it is slowly having an effect. How do you stress uh, the, how do you assess, pardon me, the strength and or lack of, of the BDS movement? So first thing, uh, I'm impressed that with Ms. Mustafa's sudden concern for trials when she's very ready to condemn Israel for all kinds of nonsense that she invented without a trial. The Israeli soldiers went in there calm to bring down, this Asselin, young terrorist to trial. I'm not done. I'm not done. We've decided to let the other one speak, please. She's decided, Israel's decided to, to send 20 soldiers who have families to risk their lives to bring this young terrorist to trial instead of killing him by a drone like Russia is doing. And Russia is Iran's ally in Syria, as you know. Regarding BDS, BDS's stated purpose is anti-normalization. So don't tell me the purpose is to bring them to the negotiating table. Jewish Voices for Peace is a fig leaf for BDS and other groups that hate Israel. Look, Jews are on our side, like Mus Ms. Mus stuff I used at the beginning, it makes it seem kosher to them and nobody else. Here's the reality. The Palestinians have rejected three offers that would have given them all the land they claim to want in the last 15 years. If you had a person in your neighborhood who was living off welfare, doing drugs and living a destructive lifestyle and rejected three offers of a job and an apartment in 15 years, would you call that person oppressed? Would you call that an atrocity? If there's an atrocity, that that person is exploiting people's kindness to keep living like this. If you want to bring Palestinians to the negotiating table, which I really hope they will do, and if you want suffering to lessen on both sides, which I pray it will, you have to give them incentives to come negotiate and make compromises like both sides have to make. It's not going to happen if you keep giving moral cover to terrorists and are concerned with the welfare of terrorists in jail instead of their victims. Sorry, in hospitals instead of their victims. But Mr. Asselin, if, if I may push you on that point, um, when we talk about the BDS movement, um, Jewish Voice for Peace, again, is made up of a significant number of Jews. And as Ms. Kar Mustafa there cited earlier, um, there are studies which show that Jews abroad, outside of Israel, are feeling disconnected from Israel, some of them, that is. Um, isn't that showing that there is something wrong within Israel? It shows that propaganda has an effect. It shows that after 2,000 years of homelessness, a lot of people have post-traumatic stress disorder oh. and are willing to do anything to feel safe. And it's the same, don't laugh when I'm talking, and it's the same equivalent of some black people uh, at the I'm end of slavery, love. or even with segregation, some people at the end of slavery and the end of segregation were also uh, shamefully in favor of slavery. Black people infla had slaves and some of them were, were opposing uh, desegregation. People who have suffered, tend sometimes to take positions that uh, uh, perpetuate the suffering. Jewish Voice for Peace doesn't represent Jews. It's not their voice, and they're certainly not in favor of peace. They are a fig leaf to, to spin what is an anti-Israel campaign based on lies and distortions of international law, which is BDS, as something that's based on human rights, which it demonstrably isn't. And Ms. Mustafa did the same shameful thing, justifying uh, anti-Israel hatred by pointing to a few Jews who want to fit into their societies or are tired of hearing propaganda against Israel. I could do the same thing with any group, okay? You can find people who will justify persecution in any group. If I did that, I would be a bad person. And I think it's terrible that you are referring to fig leaf groups to justify what the vast majority of Jews oppose. Okay, Ms. Karma, okay. how do you feel about Can the Can I have movement? a word now? I, I have to say, I, I did laugh, especially when uh, Mr. Asselin actually said that I, th that I milked the emotion when Mr. Asselin brings in 2,000 years of history. Zionism is a recent movement that is made up That's of Jewish fact, supremacists who are expansionists and colonialists. They have come from Eastern Europe and they have stolen Palestinian land words. and they have done that through ethnic... I did, I, I did not interrupt you, so you do not interrupt me. You're free you to laugh actually. if you want, because you I found actually. what you said very laughable, but do not interrupt me. And so Israel, Zionism is a Jewish supremacist ideology that was created in Eastern Europe and made up of colonialist supremacists who went into Palestine and invaded the land that wasn't theirs and actually, actually committed ethnic cleansing. So the idea of bringing in emotion and bringing in 2,000 years of history and comparing black slavery to a group that is made of supremacists who oppress the pa population of Palestine for the best part of 70 years is utterly shameful. But again, 
not surprising. Now speaking, now how many groups are fig leaf groups? You have the Naturae Carta, you have the uh, Jews for Peace, you have, the, you have countless, you have countless groups made up of Jews who are actually sickened to the death by what Israel is doing and what my people are saying that it is done in the name of the Jewish faith. I think the whole of the world is waking up to the atrocities committed by Israel and first and foremost, thankfully, it is the Jews who are coming, becoming aware of the atrocities that are committed in their names. They are not fig leaf groups. They are very representative of Jewish groups across the world. And the proof again is in the pudding when the statistics from incredibly neutral uh, opinion uh, pollsters are showing that there is an absolute disgust with Israeli policy, first and foremost amongst Jewish people. Um, Mr. Esselein, uh, as I'd far like as being respond, aware, um, I wanted to ask you about this uh, recent statement that a joint list MK, Mr. Ahmed Tibi, made. Um, he's accused the current Israeli administration of being so extreme that in his words, quote, Netanyahu is the moderate, end quote. Um, Netanyahu himself, in the run-up to his re-election, very clearly said that um, he would never allow for an independent Palestinian state um, under his rule. So um, when you talk about peace, how are we to come to terms with that? So first of all, I want to respond to the absolutely ridiculous, infantile and cartoonish fairy tale that Miss Mustafa just repeated over and over again. And if somebody were to repeat that to anybody for 30 years, they start to believe it. But it's absolute nonsense. Okay. Now, fortunately or unfortunately for her, Chief Rabbi uh, Mustafa, who's decided what Judaism and Zionism means, is in bad company because I'm not an Eastern European Jew. My parents are refugees from an Arab country and they've always been Zionists and so I'm have sure. been their ancestors since the dawn of Judaism. The first lines in the Bible that Jews believed uh, uh, 3,000 years ago or 2,000 years ago was to Abraham to go to Zion. Now, I'm not a religious person, but that corresponds to also 3,000 years of history. So to say that Zionism has been invented in Eastern Europe is just very convenient. Also, I find it despicable to sort the good Jews and the bad Jews. The good Jews are the Jews who agree with her. The bad Jews are all the other Jews who actually want to be equal to everybody else and claim a little bit of space in their ancient homeland in the Middle East. Now regarding peace, again, the Palestinians have been offered peace three times. They've rejected statehood them and Arab leaders six or seven times in history. There is no other example of this in human history. If you want the Palestinians to come to the table and Israel to afford them a state, which it has offered them many times. Israelis feel like, must feel like they're not committing suicide. There's no international law anywhere that requires that a state commit suicide. The Palestinians need to realize they need to make a compromise. They're going to have to live side by side with Israel, even if it hurts, even if it doesn't please them, even if they've been taught a narrative that is false, like Miss Mustafa's. And I know this because I've taught this class at university, okay? I am, I, I am a, a researcher and an expert on this, and actually my research tries to promote peace between the sides, not just to uh, inflame tensions. But as long as you have this narrative that's giving moral cover to terrorism and making some reporters sound interesting to themselves on TV and is demonizing one side, it doesn't matter what the politicians say because nothing's gonna get better. Mr. Esselin, I'm, I'm sorry, but I want to push you on this because Netanyahu, again, clearly said that he would not allow oh, sure. for an independent Palestinian state under his rule. Uh, certainly that is not conducive for peace. Uh, the Palestinian Authority has similarly said that it would never recognize Israel's Jewish state and all kinds of other things. Mr. Netanyahu, I am not his representative, has said all kinds of things that go in every direction. He's a politician and he's trying to please everybody. The Israeli people and the Israeli governments in the past have s consistently offered 100% or near 100% of all the land the Palestinians requested and all kinds of other measures, including symbolic uh, um, uh, measures for the right of return uh, that doesn't really exist in international law and things of that kind. The, there is an article right now tracking all the polls of Palestinians throughout history. Because of this narrative that is being peddled, like in your introduction, like the images you're showing now, Mr. Probably, Salana, I do apologize for like interrupting. We just have two Mustafa. minutes left. I do apologize for cutting into your words there. I just wanted to get your final, both of your final words, uh, if I may. Ms. Kar Mustafa, go ahead with your, with your comments on, on what's being said. Well, well, well I, I've, I've clearly one. rattled Mr. Asseline's cage, obviously, because he seems to be very upset with what I've said, even though I've stated facts. I mean, Theodor Herzl no is Hungarian. I'm sure he's not, he's not from discontent. any Arab country. And I'm sure Mr. Asseline would recognize that his parents weren't called Yupa in any other country, but in European countries, whereby they actually received protection in the Middle East, in Iran and in Turkey, when their European counterpart were being persecuted by Westerners. Um, but just to last 
last point about the, the string of, of allegations Don't teach about me how the history, PLO please. said that it doesn't recognize Israel. Do not interrupt me. I was gracious. I did not interrupt your inanity. So please, come no, on. No, you weren't. Um, and Palestine, no, weren't. the PLO actually A recognized and removed the gracious. statement from its charter in 1988. And Yasser Arafat repeatedly recognized. And False. the uh, Arab League actually offered a full recognition of Israel uh, in 2002. And that was consistently absolutely rejected by Israel. Why? Because Israel wants, as Mr. Asseline mentions, he, spe he states Judea and Samaria, which is the entire region under Jewish supremacist law. And it complete with complete disregard of Palestinian rights, where Palestinians are untermensch and whereby the entire region it becomes under Israeli authority. I think we've seen it just today, just this week, when Benjamin Netanyahu has requested that the, even the Golan Heights become recognized as Israeli. I think it very much reveals the expansionist nature of Israel and confirms pretty much that whatever I've said, regardless of how infantile it may seem okay. to Mr. Um, Asseline, is straightforward I do apologize for having fact. to cut in. I Thank do apologize. You. We'll have to continue this conversation at a later date. I do apologize to both of you for running out of time there. That was Middle East expert and journalist Ms. Hafsa Kara Mustafa, who was joining us live from London. And we were also joined by international relations expert Mr. Philippe Asseline, who was speaking to us live from Los Angeles. And of course, viewers, we do appreciate you joining us for this edition of the debate. Until next time, good night.